Fix it in post is a phrase that can send shivers down the spine of any person working in post production. But is the sentiment really all that bad? Well, in this course, I want to see if we can answer that question by looking at how we can take the sentiment of Fix it in post and the tools that we have at our disposal to create cinematic lighting within After Effects. We'll look at the relationship between the gaffer and the cinematographer on set and how we can augment some of those techniques and thought processes in post-production by creating more depth in our images, bringing texture to our scene, creating volumetric lighting effects and much more. I'm Tom Graham for Invado Tuts Plus and I'm a filmmaker with a decade's worth of experience working across the film and television industry. I've worked both in the camera and lighting departments across various productions and throughout that time I've also continued to work as an editor as well. So I'm excited to share with you some of the knowledge, some of the techniques, some of the tips and tricks that I've picked up along the way in this course. Now this course is made possible by Invato Elements, which is a really easy to use subscription service that gives you unlimited access to millions of digital assets that are available to download and use in your projects right away. We're talking about things like video templates, stock footage, music, and much more. So click the link in the description below to learn more about Invato Elements today. This course is going to have some distinct chapters and the way I'm going to lay it out for you is important as each idea will kind of flow into the next. But if you are really keen to skip to a specific topic, then make sure you check out the video description below and I'll have all of the time codes listed out for you. I'll first take you through the on-set relationship between the cinematographer and the gaffer, which will then feed into the conversation with some wider context. We'll look at then creating depth and adding texture. We'll discuss motivated and non-motivated light sources. We'll look at augmenting highlights and shadows and how to place lights in your frame on set and then remove them in post for some specific looks on a budget. We'll then look at how to generate volumetric lighting and finally how to tie everything together with some color correction. What you'll learn from this course are some fundamentals about lighting for film and television, as well as the practical tools for recreating and augmenting these processes in After Effects. This is going to be a fun mix of theory and practice and I can't wait to jump into it with you. We'll leave After Effects closed for the time being and instead let's first think about the relationship between the key people on set that are responsible for creating the lighting environment. I'm going to break this down at a beginner level for those who aren't familiar with how departmental lines are drawn on a film set. Now this will shift a little bit depending on where you live but I'm going to speak from experience from my work here in Australia. The two key departments that are responsible for lighting in the sense that it appears in the finished product are the electrics department and the camera department. Now the electrics department, also known as the lighting department, is pretty obvious. This is generally composed of the gaffer, who is the head of department and works directly with the director of photography, also known as the cinematographer, who is the head of the camera department. Under the gaffer, you have the best boy electric, which is unfortunately a bit of an outdated term these days, we tend to say best person, who is not only a hands-on second in charge for the department, but is also responsible for organizing the department and any other electrics assistants that work under them of a called third, fourth, fifth, or sixth electrics. Now the camera department is set up in a similar fashion with the DOP at the head, who is the creative lead, working closely with the director. Underneath the DOP, there is the first assistant camera, often called the first AC, who is generally responsible for not only being the focus puller on set, but for managing the rest of the camera department, including the gear. There are definitely some other nuances as well, depending on the specific set, but that is the general layout of the camera and lighting department. So what we're getting at here is that a film set is quite a hierarchical space, and it's necessary to understand this layout in order then to understand how these ideas and creative decisions can eventually flow down to someone working in post-production and how you might look to communicate with these roles if you're working on say short films, music videos or commercials as an editor. The two roles that we'll focus on for the purpose of this course are the DOP and the gaffer. Now the DOP and the gaffer work in tandem, both as department heads. The gaffer supports the DOP to support the creative vision of the director. They do this by creating the lighting environment and shaping the light together. The gaffer is responsible for actually physically manipulating the lighting technologies to do so, and the DOP is responsible for creatively composing that vision within the frame, all stemming from the wishes of the director. It's really important that these two roles work very well together and you'll often find that an experienced gaffer and DP will have a great language of shorthand communication between them on set, especially when one is working to describe what they need from the other even if they've never actually worked together before. So we've talked about the relationship between the gaffer and the DOP, but what is it in practice that they actually do on set and how can we bring that into After Effects? To investigate this further, I want to look at three fundamentals, depth, texture, and motivation. So let's talk depth. 
So when we talk about creating a cinematic image or adding cinematic lighting and effects to our work, oftentimes people will boil the term cinematic down to the illusion of depth that is created within the 2D image presented to us. Depth within the image is created by the cinematographer through various practical methods. They can capture depth through the use of exposure techniques, like using fast lenses, large sensors, or filtration in front or behind the lens. And another way of creating depth is by the composition of objects and subjects within the frame in relation to the camera, otherwise often referred to as mise-en-scene. Let's unpack the exposure techniques here. Modern digital cinema cameras capture images by exposing the digital sensor to wavelengths of light that are concentrated onto the sensor via specialty lenses. I'm assuming that if you're watching this content, then you've got a pretty good understanding of the fundamentals of how a camera works, but you might not know exactly how a cinematographer can manipulate various settings on the camera and combinations of camera and lens hardware to create different looks and feelings in the final image, especially when it comes to creating a sense of depth. A shallow depth of field is often what characterizes a cinematic image. This is when the subject or object is sharp in the frame, nicely in focus, and then the background and foreground elements are blurred out. A shallow depth of field creates a very defined spot within 3D space that the audience is guided to pay attention to. It melts away the background elements and really focuses our concentration on that particular element. The opposite of this technique is referred to as deep focus and is characterized by everything in the frame being in focus, the foreground, the middle of the shot, and the deep background. Each of these is a tool used to further the story and to guide the viewer towards where the director wants them to go. To create a shallow depth of field, the cinematographer would pair a large sensed camera with a lens that has a large aperture, often referred to as a fast lens, shooting with it wide open. They would then use neutral density filters to control the exposure of the shot and would work with the gaffer to also control the amount of light hitting the subject, resulting in a shallower depth of field in the image. To do the opposite would be to stop down the lens, decreasing the size of the aperture removing or decreasing the amount of neutral density filtration on the lens and working with the gaffer to increase the light intensity on the scene. This would result in deep focus. There are two other simple and practical ways to change the sense of depth within a scene. And note that we're no longer speaking specifically about depth of field, but the sense of overall depth from the foreground to the background within the shot. The first technique is by changing the focal length of the lens. A wider focal length, which equates to a smaller number, like 18mm for example, increases the separation between the foreground and the background. Whereas a longer lens, or a lens with a larger focal length, such as a 100mm lens, works to compress the foreground and the background together. Now each has their own distinct look and they work to tell two very different stories. A super close-up image of an actor being frenetic in front of the camera will result in frantic, nervous, uncomfortable movements on a wide-angle lens. A super long shot of an actor walking towards the camera will result in a feeling of little progress, or when used in a smaller location, a sense of claustrophobia. Another technique to manipulate the sense of depth within your shot is to bring foreground elements into the scene. So have the subject or the object in focus within the midpoint of your 3D space, the far background blurry and out of focus, and then the close foreground out of focus as well. Alright, so we've got a pretty good understanding now. I think it's time to jump into After Effects. Let's look at how we can begin to create these cinematic effects on our images, and we'll do so by employing the techniques on depth we've just talked about. So having just learned a little bit about the theory of depth, let's look at how we can actually put some of these theories into practice within After Effects. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up our first lesson. So first of all, let's just create some more depth within this image. Let's analyze the image first. So we've got this lady here in the orange top. She is drinking a cup of tea, cup of coffee, whatever it tends to be, talking to her mate on the corner here on the left. Now he is slightly out of focus and you can see the background behind her is also slightly out of focus. But to me, I wouldn't necessarily say this is a cinematic shot. I wouldn't say that you have sort of cinematic lighting. I wouldn't say that you have anything remarkable in terms of the depth of field uh, being shallow and cinematic, how we've kind of come to think about it, like we just explained uh, previously. So how can we take some of the basic tools in After Effects and make this shot uh, just a little bit more engaging, a little bit more visually interesting and, and just start to bring, I guess, that term cinematic into this shot. All right, so what I wanna do here is I wanna bring her into full focus. And that means dropping both the background and the foreground off. I wanna make sure that she is a center of attention. Uh, and I'll do that by creating some masks, changing the blur uh, for our foreground and our background, 
I'll crop the image a little bit as well because at the moment there's a lot of kind of superfluous things around, uh, around her that is distracting us from focusing our attention on her. Uh, and then I'll also just give it a very, very minor color correction slash color grade in After Effects. So let's get started then. The first thing we wanna do is create a couple of masks. So we're going to mask around our guy here uh, and we're going to also mask around the background here as well. So we need three copies of this piece of footage. So let's just duplicate this piece of footage uh, twice so that we've got three copies. So I'm just hitting Command D on my keyboard here twice. And now we've got our bottom layer, our middle layer and our top layer. Let's just label these so we can keep track. So I've just labeled these. We've got woman uh, at the bottom here. So that'll be the middle. Uh, we've got the man on the left, so we'll mask him out. And then we've got the plant in the background as well. So we'll mask that. Let's start with our guy on the left here. So just making sure that we've got our man layer selected. Let's go up and grab our pen tool up here. You can also hit G on your keyboard. So with this layer selected, let's just make a little mask around him. And we don't need to go too tight with this because we'll be doing a lot of feathering. So uh, also note that he is blurry here, but his arm is sort of in focus when it's coming into this middle plane. So let's not get too much of his arm or the coffee cup, we're just kind of going around like so. And we'll just give it a little bit uh, more extra through the middle. And we'll go up and just close this mask around here. It can be really uh, loose around the corner here. Uh, it's, it, it's no bother. Now, uh, what's that done? Nothing at the moment. So let's just close off our woman and our plant image by turning the little eye off here. And you can see there we've got uh, this guy here. So we'll go up into our effects and presets and we're going to be using a lot of Gaussian blurs for this. So grab Gaussian blur and just drag and drop that onto our layer. Now we can change the amount of blur that we want to use uh, on each mask later on, depending on how, uh, I guess, how shallow we want our depth of field to come off. Right now, let's just give this something like 20 uh, and you can see there it's immediately given us a bit more of a blur. Now, staying on our man layer here, I'm going to hit M on my keyboard just to bring up the mask properties and I'll hit M just a couple of times uh, so I can bring up all of the mask properties. You've got the path, feather, opacity, and expansion. First of all, let's grab our feather and we'll just feather that mask out quite a bit. Uh, and you can see here, we're kind of like, we wanna get it towards the edge of his head but without cutting him off too much. And then on our mask expansion, let's just play with that a little bit uh, to kind of see how that feels. And I want it roughly around about there. So that's just giving a nice little bit of fall off. And once we start bringing our images back in, for instance, if I turn the main layer back on, you can see here that we've got this nice, just kind of like fall off of the blur through here. Now you can see in this middle section, it's going to look a little bit wacky for a a moment, but we can actually play with this a little bit later on. And we can always add some more masks if, for instance, this uh, purple and blue image up on the top here is, is standing out a little bit too much and feels a bit sharp overall. We can always finesse that later on. So next up, we're going to move over and make our background blurry, these plants here, the plants up in the back uh, in this kind of pillow section. Now, if you think about this image in 3D space, uh, her eyes are what's in focus. Now, think about where the camera is pointed. It's pointing directly at her. So her eyes here and anything along this horizontal plane in 3D space should be in focus. Now, it doesn't look like there's anything actually in the shot that is on that horizontal plane. You've got her eyes and kind of her hand and you've probably got at the moment, I would say roughly you've got about a foot or so where things are in focus, then everything else around it starts to blur, uh, you know, depending on how far away it gets from that focus point. So we want things to only be in focus on that plane really. So you can see here, her legs are a little bit uh, forward of that plane. So we can start to blur those out as well. And then obviously the couch behind her. So we wanna grab the plant layer and we'll again go to our pen tool. And let's just start making a little bit of a mask that kind of encapsulates all of the areas that we don't wanna be in focus now. So we kinda of wanna get this little bit as well, which we didn't get with our uh, guy here. So if I turn that off and on, uh, you can see here, it's still a little bit sharp. So on this plant layer, we'll just make this mask kind of sit around here. And again, don't worry too much about uh, how precise you need to be. We can always fine tune this a little bit later on. And you can see her knee here goes a little bit closer to the camera. So I'm actually gonna bring this mask all the way around just to kind of wrap everything around there. And I'll turn the bottom layer off again so we can just have a look at what's happening on the plant layer. We'll go up again and grab a Gaussian blur, dropping that on our plant layer here. And let's just drop this to maybe 30 in the background there. And that looks pretty good. And hitting M a few times on the keyboard to bring up our mask properties, feathering things out. And we wanna make sure we're not grabbing her too much on the side there. I'm actually just going to grab my pen tool again and just add another little mask point here, just so we can make this a little bit more defined around her head. 
and we'll grab the mask expansion and we'll just play with that as well. I think at this time we need to turn on the bottom layer so we can kind of see how it's all gelling together. So I'm just playing with the mask expansion here, bringing it right to the back of her hair. And I think that looks pretty good. I'll click off and just see how we're feeling. Now, personally, I think we've gone a bit too hard on the blur here. So let's go into our plant layer and we'll drop that back down to say 20. And let's feather things out a bit more. That's looking pretty good. Let's show you off and on. So I'm just going to select all of my uh, layers here uh, and I will turn the plant and the man layer off and you'll see there that's jumped back, not into focus, but what it originally was. Uh, and then if I turn them back on, you can see that's created a much more defined space where her eyes were already in focus for us to kind of pay attention to. We're not really paying that much attention to this guy anymore uh, and not really paying that much attention to what's around her. Now, what I do wanna do is I wanna reframe this a little bit. I mentioned at the start of this little lesson that we wanted to kind of reframe and make things look a little bit more cinematic, I guess. That's the whole, that's the whole intention of this course. Now you saw in the theoretical part of this lesson how changing the focal length of your lens can also uh, dramatically increase or decrease the depth of field that you're working with. And you know, it can kind of just change the overall look of the image. So let's just try recropping this like we were shooting it on a longer lens now that we've put these blurs in place. So I'm just going to highlight all of these layers, selecting them all, hitting S on the keyboard, and I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here. And then I'm gonna hit A for our anchor point and just start to reframe things a little bit like so. Still making sure that we're focusing on her. And we've now put her on the right third. So let's see what that looks like if we turn our blurs off. So it looks, you know, okay. <laughs> uh, but if we turn them on and now that we've recropped things, we're starting to look a lot more, I guess, interesting. There's a bit more intrigue in this shot now. Let me just bring in the original shot again so we can see it in comparison. So now we can have a look at the original underneath. So this is what we started with. But you know, like I've said before, we, we just want to improve it a little bit more. It's, it's an okay shot, but there's not a huge amount of intrigue in it. So now let's turn our layers on that we're working with, which is of course our blur and our reframing. And we're already starting to just get a little bit more uh, sense of something happening in this shot. It's a little bit more serious. All right, so how can we take it a little bit further though? Well, we'll go to our man layer first and up in our effects and presets, let's just search for brightness and contrast. We'll drop that onto the layer and let's just start to bring the brightness down. We'll bring the contrast up as we do that as well. Bringing the brightness down a little bit more. And we're going to do the exact same thing on our plant layer. So we can just actually copy and paste that over and we can go a little bit further with the brightness on the plant layer. And we'll just play around with the contrast as well. So now let's uh, turn those off and on. It's just really starting to focus our attention in on this woman. So this is in comparison with our original and we just always like to go back and see where we've started from and where we're going. You don't wanna take things too far. You wanna make it feel like it still fits in the realm of possibility. Uh, so turning back on our layers, which includes our crop, which includes our blurs for our foreground and our background, and it includes a little bit of an exposure adjustment for those foreground and background elements. We're starting to look a lot more cinematic. So how can we just finally pull all of this together? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight our man, woman, and plant layers. I'm going to right click and we're going to pre-compose these and we're going to call this uh, cinematic coffee. Why not? And on that, we're going to add a Lumetri color. Now in our Lumetri color, we're just going to start off with our basic correction and we're going to bring the highlights down just a little bit. We're going to actually increase the blacks a little bit as well. That's gonna give us that kind of, you know, less contrasty look in the shadows. Pull the whites down just a little bit as well. Add in a little bit more contrast. It might seem counterintuitive, but you are gonna get kind of milkier blacks here, uh, which is, I guess, a bit more cinematic. If you wanna learn more about proper color grading, uh, head over to the Invado Tuts Plus YouTube channel. We've got a great color grading uh, tutorial there for DaVinci Resolve. Obviously DaVinci Resolve is the uh, preeminent, it's the industry standard color grading uh, and color correction piece of software. But you know, you can take those ideas and the theories about color grading and color correction into uh, other programs like After Effects when you've got tools such as the Lumetri color tab, just to do little tweaks here and there and, and kind of bring it all together. 
So that's our exposure controls there. Let's just drop the saturation off by about 10. Uh, it's going to drop it down a bit, but we'll fix that and we'll bring a bit more life into it in just a second. Going down into the creative section here, add just a little bit of the faded film look. Uh, and then in our vibrance, we're gonna drop that up by about 15. Uh, and what vibrance does is instead of in saturating the entire image, it pulls out key colors. So obviously the blues here uh, in her cup, we've got a very ob obviously orange vibrant jumper, a little bit of color up here. And it starts to saturate those colors and it doesn't really pay too much attention to the kind of more mid-range colors like this guy's beard and his blue top here, uh, the plant in the background. So it's just going to add a bit more vibrance to the key colors here. Uh, and then we can just play around with the saturation a little bit just to see if you want a little bit more punch in things. Uh, I think maybe about 110 there will work pretty good. Uh, and then finally, you know, <laughs> teal and orange is the cinematic look. So let's just add a little bit of uh, teal into our shadows and a little bit of orange into our highlights and just sort of see, see where we land. All right, so let's have a look at our original. I'll show you this with the uh, Lumetri color off first. So that's off and this is on. Now, if we go back to our original here, that's our original. Two people sitting on the couch. The focus of our attention already is the woman's eyes because they're the main part in the footage that are in focus. She's also centered in the frame, which is quite nice, but there's a lot of negative space on the right-hand side of frame here. So what we've done is we've cropped things in, we've added some fake blurs around here and around here just to really sell that we're supposed to be looking at her. I've reframed her to be on the right thirds and we've color graded just to give uh, a little bit more intrigue and suspense into this image. So let's play it through and see what that looks like. And we'll compare it to our original. So in my opinion, I think we've just added a bit more character to the shot. Now, obviously this is me just going through things relatively quickly to see uh, how fast we can just add some character to our shot. Uh, so, you know, feel free to jump in and play around with Lumetri Color to get you know, a different look to your footage here. Maybe you wanna not make the orange as vibrant, or maybe you wanna really pull down the background in terms of the exposure. It's a completely up to you, but these are some of the quick tools that you can use in After Effects to start to add some more cinematic lighting to your projects. All right, so that's the first lesson in creating a sense of depth uh, in your image. So what's another way that we can add some depth? All right, let's jump into the next lesson. And that is the dirty foreground. So we've got this shot here of this woman walking up to her bench, grabbing an apple and you know, having a bit of a throw around with it. Now it's a, it's a pretty good image. Uh, it's, you know, it's nicely lit, uh, it's well color balanced, but in my opinion, it's a little bit bland on the left-hand side. You've just got a big area of white nothingness, uh, which obviously is the motivation for the light. And we'll talk about motivated and non-motivated light sources later on in this course. But at the moment, this is just a bit, uh, there's nothing there. We just wanna add something else in here to kind of break the shot up a little bit and make it not feel as sparse. So what can we do? So in the theoretical part of this course, we talked about bringing in those foreground elements that help to achieve a sense of depth by creating a foreground. So at the moment in this shot with no foreground elements, you've got the part that's in focus, which is this person and the fruit. And then you've got the background, which is out of focus. But bringing in some of these foreground elements will really help to just create more of a sense of depth within this room. So let's look at how we can do it. So a very easy way to do this is just bringing in a PNG image of something like a plant uh, with the background removed uh, so it's on alpha. Uh, and then we can lay that over the top uh, of our image like so. Uh, and then obviously we'll work through the tools of how to make this work. But there's a really cool thing on Envato Elements which you may not have used before and I'm just going to show you it right now because it's very handy for this kind of work, especially when you're just blurring things out and you just really need the shape of something. And the reason why I'm going down this route is because uh, when I was preparing this course for you, I really wanted the rear of a coffee machine for something we're about to do uh, in this lesson. And I was trying to find a photo of the rear of a coffee machine and you know, no one takes a photo of the rear of a coffee machine. So I thought, how can we get all of the angles that we need for these kind of images to make things work on this kind of fake set that we're building? Well, the answer is the 3D assets on Envato Elements and let me show you them right now. So if you go to Envato Elements and you go up to this section here that says more, you can go down to our 3D section. And like I mentioned, I wanted to find the rear of a coffee machine. So I just searched coffee machine. And you'll see this a little later on in this lesson, but this is the one that I used. Clicked in on this, view 360 render. 
And once this is loaded, you can then just drag around any angle that you want. And so, of course, I wanted the rear of the coffee machine. And then I thought where I want to place it in the image is actually kind of on this angle and get a little bit of the coffee machine here and the cups on the top. So what I did was I downloaded that angle and you'll see me bring it into After Effects just now. So there we go, I've got that angle of the coffee machine, which I'm going to add onto our fake bench that's going to be in the foreground. And I'm also going to bring in a 3D potted plant as well. So I'll bring that in and then we'll start working out how we can make these fit into our image. So I'm just gonna trim these at the back here so we don't have any excess. Uh, and by the way, I'm just doing Command Shift D to trim our clips there. So we'll start off with the potted plant. I'm just going to move it into place, scale this up, and it's going to be roughly about here. And again, we're just trying to break up this big section here, this white section. Uh, and then at the end here, I want the coffee machine to sort of sit on the bench, oh, pardon me. I want the coffee machine to sort of sit on the bench here. Uh, let's say it's like we've got a bench in the front. So the bench goes around the back here towards camera and then we're pretending that there's a bench continuing around. So the coffee machine would sit here, we'll scale it down a little bit so it feels like it's real size and it would sit there. And then if you think about this, the plant would be on uh, the camera side of the bench as well. So we're going to take the same techniques that we used last time, and that's basically just different levels of Gaussian blur. So let's get a Gaussian blur going for these. I'm going to pull this onto our potted plant first, and this one will be technically closer to camera. So I'm going to give this about 30. And this one here will be slightly further away from camera, slightly closer to the plane of focus. So we'll give this one probably about 15 maybe 20. And at the moment that looks pretty good. So now we've got this coffee machine on the bench and we've got this plant uh, which is much closer to camera. But we actually don't want it to come in that close. We want the plant to start here and we want the coffee machine to kind of finish here. So we need to do a little bit of motion tracking and it's really simple. Just clicking on our bottom layer here, we're going to right click and go track and stabilize and go down to track motion. Now what it'll do is it'll ask us to pick a point in space that we are tracking. So you just drag these little boxes out here and then when you click, you can pull it down and find the part that you want to track. So I'll just track one of these grapes here. And what I wanna try and do is get, you know, a little bit of the color of the apple on the inside of this tracking point. And then this outside tracking point as well um, just helps to keep everything in space. Now, if you make this too big, this will take forever. So don't make this too big. Uh, what you wanna do now is go to the start of your clip and then hit track forward or analyze forward with the little play button over here in your tracker tab. Now I can already see that's jumping around a bit. So I'm going to stop that. I'm going to reset and I'm just gonna make my tracking point just a little bit bigger and find something a little bit more defined to work with here. Maybe the tip of the banana here. Pull this back to the start. And we'll go through. That looks a bit better. It's not jumping around so much. So now that we've got our tracking point done there, we wanna edit our target. And this one, we're trying to target the potted plant. So we'll hit okay on that and then click apply uh, and also apply it dimensions to X and Y. So now you can see our potted plant is tracked with the motion of the camera, but it is moved around because our anchor point is centered in this. So all we need to do on our potted plant layer here is hit A to select our anchor point, go back to the very start of the clip and reposition things where we want them to be. So it was around about here and slightly up, maybe a little bit further over. Uh, so the idea would be if you can see the wall running along here, I guess the plant would be sitting at the ground here near our uh, fake, uh, or it could actually be there <laughs> bench, but in, in this world, because we don't know what's there, we're calling it our fake bench. So let's just say the potter plant is sitting around there. Now, if we track forward, it's going to track across like that. Now we also need to do the same thing for our coffee machine here because we want it to land in this space right at the end, but it will probably be off screen at the start. So how do we do that? Well, we just go back into our uh, main clip we go into our motion source here on our tracker window. We go to the piece of footage. Uh, we're selecting the same tracker, tracker one, and hit edit target. And this time go to espresso machine, hit okay and hit apply. And now you can see the exact same things happened, but our potter plant is still in the right place. And now our coffee machine as well is tracked. Again, the same process with the coffee machine, hit A uh, to bring up your anchor point properties and just move it back to where you want it to be. I'm going to go to the end of the clip here and position it where I want it to land. And it's just going to be mm, roughly around here. I think it's sitting a bit high, so bring it down. That looks pretty good. Let's play it back and see what it looks like.
Now I think it looks good, but I do think that things look a little bit weird when she comes past the coffee machine. I think it should be a little bit more blurry. So I'm gonna go through and increase the Gaussian blur on the coffee machine, maybe to 25. And you know what? I wanna make the pot plant a little bit higher as well. So I'm gonna hit the anchor point there and bring it up. Don't wanna see the bottom of it because obviously that's gonna sit on the ground. So there you go, I think that looks pretty good. We'll show you with off and again, we remember that, oh, there was absolutely nothing in this shot here and it was just a big white uh, nothingness uh, and then all of our interest was on the right hand side of the frame and we've put our potted plant in just to break that up a little bit and not just have such a white space and then add the little coffee machine as well. Uh, and look, I mean, I know that it's a 3D asset. You know that it's a 3D asset because you've peeled back the curtain and seen the behind the scenes, but to someone just looking at this, they're gonna go, oh yeah, there's a coffee machine on the bench there. And because we can use the 3D renders on Envato Elements, we can get any angle that we want to kind of sell this effect. So there we go, that's adding depth in two different ways uh, by adding elements to our foreground to create a foreground and then obviously mid and background or blurring things out and reframing our footage as well as a bit of color grading to create a more cinematic look from what was maybe not so cinematic a shot to start with. <laughs> All right, so let's jump back into the theory portion of this course and we'll move on to our next lesson. So now that we know how to create a sense of depth in our images, just by using some simple tools in After Effects, let's look at another key element of what the gaffer and the DOP are looking to achieve on set, texture. Now texture is maybe not something that you associate with light, but trust me, there is certainly a way to create texture with light. Actually, it's often with the absence of light, we're talking about shadows. There's nothing more bland on camera than a white wall. So watch any decent Hollywood film and look at the walls of a room. If the production designers haven't dressed an area for whatever reason, or if the room is by its nature made up of mostly blank white walls, chances are the cinematographer along with the gaffer will have worked in a way to break up the blank space through the use of camera motivated shadows or dappled light. This works when there is a clear light source like a window, a practical lamp, a TV or things of that nature something that would realistically throw light onto the wall. In the case of a window, the gaffer would often have a directional light outside of the window, facing back into the interior location to simulate the sun, but with the added benefit of being able to control it. Then they might simply rig up a branch with some leaves from a nearby tree or a synthetic version of the same, so as to throw a dappled light onto the wall rather than having it be doused in one big spill of light. If this was in the noir genre, you might expect them to use some Venetian blinds on the window to create that classic lines of shadow look. So that's all good and well in the real world, but how does that relate to After Effects? Well, it's actually remarkably easy to begin to sell some of these same lighting effects within After Effects, through the use of some really basic fundamental tools within the program. We'll step back into that project now and we'll start to look at how we can replicate the texture of light. So I don't know what it is, maybe I haven't had enough coffee today, but uh, the next example we're looking at is someone again with a cup of coffee, or maybe it's tea, who knows. Uh, but we've got this relatively nice image here. Oh, let's just play it through while I'm talking. We've got this nice image here of this lady sitting, looking out the window. It's really well exposed. You've got a nice bit of light pulling onto the background. She's really well lit. Uh, I would say this is this is quite a nice piece of footage. But what can we do? within After Effects with some basic tools to bring in some of those principles that we were just talking about in the theoretical part of this lesson uh, in terms of that dappled light, that kind of contrast between light and shadow. Uh, yeah, and how can we bring that together in After Effects to kind of just add a little bit of something more to this shot? Well, analyzing the shot, what we can see is we've got a window on the right hand side of frame here that's obviously throwing the light onto her and then throwing a little bit of that soft light onto the back wall. But she is just sitting in front of a plain you know, white-ish back wall. So what I wanna do is I wanna bring some kind of play of light and shadow onto that back wall uh, and just kind of create a little bit of separation between her and that kind of empty space. So what we're going to do is we're going to use some presets that are actually already in After Effects that you may have never used before. You might have used After Effects for 10 years and have never have clicked into the preset section uh, because you know, oftentimes it's always good to build this yourself, but there are some really great presets in After Effects. So let's look at how we can add some dappled light onto the wall in this shot. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to right click down here and create a new solid. I'm gonna create a black solid here and we'll just leave that atop. 
uh, our image. Now I'm just gonna trim it at the back of this shot here, shift command D to split and then delete. Uh, and we've got the black solid over here. So I'm going up into our effects and presets and we'll clear this out. Animation presets at the top here, backgrounds, cinders. That's what we're looking at. I'm gonna drag and drop that over the top here. And you're going to say, Tom, what are you doing? This looks horrible. Well, don't worry. <laughs> we've, only, we've only just started this lesson. If I go down into the mode down here, the blending mode for our black solid with the cinders on it, I'm going to go from normal to add. And again, you're thinking, Tom, what's happening here? Well, what we wanna do is we wanna take these, this cinder effect, obviously this kind of like fiery cinder effect that After Effects generates as a preset. And we wanna make this act a little bit more like it's dappled light coming through a tree outside the window and then just mask it off onto the back wall. So how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna get the cinders kind of feeling a little bit better. So in our effects and presets, we're gonna go up to our old trusty friend, uh, Gaussian Blur once again. And we're going to bring a Gaussian Blur on top of this. And I'm gonna put this up to about 50, I think. And that looks pretty good to me. Now, I'm just gonna turn this off again and we're gonna analyze the shot where the light's falling. So at the moment, the light is kind of, you know, masked off here from this side of the wall. Obviously we're in shadow here. Uh, the light is falling in this direction over on this wall here and then on this face of the wood and then it drops off here. So when I turn this layer back on and with the layers selected, I wanna create a mask around that section. So uh, I'm gonna go back to the start of the shot because we will have to do a little bit of motion tracking on this. It's a handheld shot. So I'm gonna create a mask around our little wood cabinet here, around the front of it, uh, and then around this chair. And again, we don't have to be too precise because we will be doing a bit of feathering. And again, we'll just go around the back of this woman here and we'll mask all of this out later on uh, with the feather and mask expansion tools. So bringing it down here around to our elbow, we've got the table down here. Now you can see I've gone into the shadow section here. So I actually am just going to command Z a few of those and bring it up into the shadow. And there we go, that should work pretty well. Now, I think, yeah, I think that's looking pretty good. So I'll click out of this mask for a second and hitting M a few times like we did in the first lesson to bring up our mask uh, parameters here. Mask feather, let's feather this out. And you can see it's now starting to spill a little bit more, which is wonderful. Uh, and mask expansion, we'll just drag that a bit so it's not sitting on her at all. And again, that's dropping it a little bit further down in the background because you know we don't want it to be too pronounced. Now, if I click on here, you can see we've got a little bit of it falling on here, but it's, it's falling pretty hot on this wall. So what we wanna do, hit T on our black solid here to bring up our opacity. And we're just gonna drop this down to maybe like 30% or something. We don't wanna do a lot. Let's play it through and just see what it's looking like. Now you can see here the cinders kind of start to move around this section, but they're too fast uh, and obviously they've stopped at the start here, so we can fix that pretty easily. Uh, and obviously we're ignoring the fact that it's not motion tracked yet. We'll get to that in a moment. So dragging back to the start of the clip, I wanna go up here and evolution is what we're looking at here on uh, Fractal Noise 1 and Fractal Noise 2. So with my playhead at the start of the clip with the black solid selected, I'm going to uncheck the evolution stopwatch here uh, for both of the fractal noises. And I'm just gonna make sure they're both at zero and zero. And then I'm going to hit the evolution stopwatch again to create some keyframes. I'll just hit you on my keyboard here to see that I've got evolution keyframes. And I'll drag to the end of my clip and I'll create keyframes for the, both of those evolution properties once again. And for this top one, I'll just drag it down to, you know, say 80 uh, and this one maybe slightly further, 126. And we'll play that back and see what the movement looks like. And remember, we're going for the idea here that this is dappled sunlight through a tree. So there we go, playing that back through, you can see it's a lot more subtle than it was before. If I just drag my playhead over, you can see it's moving throughout now, uh, but not as much as it was. Now, the next thing I wanna do is I just wanna kind of match the, uh, the color. Uh, so I can do that here in our tritone section. If I just click on my midtones here, you can see I've got the choice to just change it to any color that I want. A really easy way to do this is just grab the eyedropper tool and just go over to an actual piece where the light is hitting and hit that there. And that way we're getting the same color light coming through. Now I, uh, I will change the highlights a little bit. So I'll go into the highlights and just give them a little bit more warmth. There we go. Doesn't do a huge amount, but it does blend things in nice 
and smoothly. So that looks pretty good there. I actually think I will just give the mid-tones slightly more warmth as well. We can give it a little bit more warmth than, uh, than it was getting. So that looks pretty good. Uh, and then the next thing we need to do is obviously motion track things. So I'm just going to make sure that I'm only tracking the part of the clip that I need and right click on our uh, actual piece of footage at the very start, track and stabilize motion, the same way we did in the first part. Just gonna widen this out and find a nice piece uh, to start tracking with. I think this part of the orange will work pretty well and we'll analyze forward. All right, so now that we've got our tracker in place, we're just gonna edit the target, make sure that it's on our black solid, hit okay, hit apply, hit okay again, and now we should be good to go. Uh, we might need to move our anchor point around like we did last time uh, in the previous lesson on depth. So let's just get our anchor point selected here and we'll drag our little dappled light situation back over to the right spot. Now you can see here, there's a portion on her elbow uh, that we need to fix with some masking. And I'd prefer if we had a little bit more light coming around the back of her head here as well. So let's just play around quickly with the mask and see if we can fix that. All right, so I've fixed that little elbow section now. Uh, the part that I don't think is working is in this section here. There's just not enough light originally hitting the part of the wood here where this light is being thrown on to kind of sell the effect. So let's just make sure that mask covers that as well. And we can do that by just adding an extra mask. So making sure our black solid is selected, uh, hitting the pen tool and just masking kind of around this section as well. And we need to go down and make that subtract. So go into our mask and go subtract. And there we go. So there we go, a pretty quick and easy way in After Effects to go from a bland wall, uh, you know, a nice shot, but with a bland wall, to adding some relatively convincing dappled light uh, into your background behind your actor. Now, there's a few things that we can do just to tighten this up. Uh, obviously, we've got a little bit of a masking issue at the top here, but if we pre-compose this and just gave uh, a little bit of a zoom in, uh, let's just do that now, pre-compose, we'll call this uh, cinematic coffee again. And we'll just give this a little bit of scale, maybe 103 might do us. And there we go. And we'll just reposition that so it's sitting at the top. And that's looking fantastic, I think. Uh, and you know, you can go through and you can change the color of the light in the background to match whatever color is coming through the window. Uh, you can change the exposure levels on the original piece of footage. But yeah, there's so many things that you can do uh, to kind of sell this effect. So don't forget that we started from a preset here in After Effects. So don't overlook these. There's some really powerful tools and yeah, a preset along with some masks and yet yeah, changing the blend mode. You know, it's pretty simple to achieve a really good looking effect here that actually does simulate having some sun streaming through some leaves and casting a bit of a dappled light onto the background of our scene here. All right, so let's move back into the theoretical part and continue this course. I think at this point, it's a great time to talk about the difference between motivated and non-motivated light sources and how we can play by the rules, but also bend the rules slightly when it comes to augmenting light sources in post-production. In its most distilled form, a motivated light source is one that has a logical place within the world of the subject or object being captured. This could come from a window, a lamp, an illuminated screen, or from interior house lighting. Now these don't necessarily need to be in the shot for them to be motivated. Oftentimes when you see a lamp or a house light in shot, you would refer to that as a practical lamp, something that is practically there in the character's world. So you could have an interior shot of a person sitting in the dark, the cooler moonlight could be streaming through a window, which would be motivated, but the subject could also be lit with a warmer fill light simulating a house lamp. Now, just because we can't actually see this lamp, it's motivated in the sense that realistically, a lamp would not be out of place in this location. And it serves us well as viewers to believe that a practical lamp is illuminating the character. Unmotivated lighting, on the other hand, is light that appears within a scene purely as a source of illumination. It doesn't appear to come from anything practical, and there seems to be no valid reason for the light to be falling the way it is. Now, there is no hard and fast rules on motivated or unmotivated light sources. However, it is important to make some creative choices when adding light either on set or in our case, in post-production as to how motivated or unmotivated you want your light sources to be. Let's have a look at these examples here from La La Land. 
You've got the two actors speaking to each other and the camera angles switch between their perspectives depending on who is delivering their lines. Notice the angle of the key light. You can see that the key light is coming from a consistent place in 3D space, the window, when switching between camera angles. This is something our brain processes in real time and it feels completely natural given the context of the scene. But compare the two angles side by side and you'll notice that from one perspective the key light is coming from the right to the left and then on the other perspective it is presented from left to right. So let's jump into After Effects again and we'll keep this example in mind whilst we look at how to create some supplemental lights within the program. Having just analysed those shots from La La Land, we can see, yeah, that the key light, it stays in a consistent spot within 3D space, but actually it changes to the left or the right of the frame, depending on the camera placement. And I think it's important to start analysing shots. If you're looking to augment or relight shots in post-production, it's really important to start analysing as many shots uh, from films, from TV shows, from commercials, from stuff you see online. Start analysing those shots and look at where the light is placed. And then that way you can kind of get an idea of the rules, but also then you can kind of understand where you can break those rules a little and, and what you can get away with. With that in mind, let's take this shot here. I'll just play it through while we're talking. It's just this guy uh, sitting on his computer looking at his little robot there. Let's analyze the lighting environment that we find ourselves in. So it seems at first glance that the key light is coming from the window here. It's a big bright source that seems to be illuminating our scene. Now obviously we've got a bit of a blue colour to it, we're looking at a kind of nighttime theme here. This might have been shot during the day, uh, but a really easy way to sell nighttime uh, when you're shooting during the day is to get that blue light streaming through and then offset that with a nice warm tungsten light. Uh, so that brings us to the light in the background, the practical lamp. Now that on first glance seems to be uh, illuminating our subject. We've got a nice, uh, we've got a nice kind of like warm light on his hair, on his face, on his hands here. Uh, and that seems to be kind of coming from this lamp environment in the middle of the scene. And also that lamp is serving to kind of make sure that this background here isn't just a deep dark pit of despair uh, where you don't see any uh, texture or anything in the background. That lamp is illuminating things just to give us a little bit more intrigue and interest in the back of the shot. Now this blue light as well is falling onto this wall in the background. This light out here would either be shot through a coloured gel, but probably more realistically in this day and age it would be with an LED fixture that can change colour, an RGB LED fixture. And we might think on first glance that the light is shining through here and hitting the back wall, but if you look at this back wall, once we pan around his chair here a little bit, you can see the light starts to fall off and it's quite bright here. So in reality, I think that there's probably another LED fixture hitting this wall with the same color blue, just to sell this lighting environment. So that's analyzing the scene at first glance. And we're looking at all the motivated light sources. So this is motivated in the sense that it's a window, it's moonlight, it's all coming through. This is motivated in the sense that it's coming from this practical lamp here, but in reality, his key light is actually unmotivated. His key light is not coming from either of these sources. It's coming from uh, off screen. So I'll just zoom out a little bit here so I can demonstrate with my mouse. We probably have a film lamp up here, not a practical lamp, but a film light uh, with the same color temperature as this lamp shining down and giving him this nice warm uh, key light here. And it's obviously hitting our robot as well. Now the reason I know it's not coming from this lamp in the background is because it's hitting the top of his head and it's hitting this side of the robot. How would that light be able to get around to this side of the robot? So we know immediately that there has to be a light source coming this way here. Now we can call that unmotivated because there is no good reason for us to believe it's coming from anywhere particular. But there could be potential that it could be a motivated light source depending on how you want to think about it because you could look at this scene and go well that could just be his bedroom lights. So there is a little bit of a kind of grey area between motivated and unmotivated but for the sake of this lesson let's call the light that we're seeing in the background here this moonlight, this window light, uh, this and this we'll call that the motivated light sources because we kind of know where they're coming from and we'll call this unmotivated. So that's what I think is actually happening on set here. I would say you've got a light uh, that's keying him here with a nice warm bit of light and then outside the window you've probably got uh, probably an LED fixture but potentially like a HMI or something like that which is a daylight balance light coming through a blue gel and starting to make this kind of feel like it's nighttime alongside this lamp. All right, so now that we've analyzed the shot, how can we use some basic tools within After Effects to change the lighting environment? Now we don't want to change it too much because you kind of want to keep things still within the realms of possibility or otherwise it'll just start to look all wacky. 
But what I want to do here is I want to just give him a little bit more fill light. I think potentially we could just have a bit more fill on this side of his face here. There's not really any fill at all. The only fill that's really happening is any bounce that's coming off the key light or maybe being bounced back from the other lights that are in our shot. And also I think uh, once we add a bit of a fill light here, I wanna bring down the ambience of this light and this window light as well in the background, just to bring our focus back to our gentleman in the middle. Well, there's various ways to do it within After Effects, but for this lesson, we're going to use the generated light sources and 3D layers approach. So we'll start by right clicking here and going new light. Now, if you haven't worked with lights in After Effects yet, don't worry, it's relatively simple. Uh, we've got four different light types. We've got parallel, spot, point, and ambient. They all do kind of different things, and you can use them individually or in combination uh, with each other to achieve different results. For this fill light that we wanna get on the side of his face, I'm going to start with a spotlight. And then don't worry about the other parameters yet, the intensity, the cone angle and stuff. We can change that once we come back in and tweak things. We'll just hit okay for now and see what happens. Well, nothing's happened because we haven't switched on a 3D layer. So the light sources only hit layers that have been switched to 3D. And to do that, it's really easy. In our switches section down here, and don't worry if you don't see this, right click and go columns and make sure switches is turned on. Down here, this little box, 3D layer, allows this layer to be manipulated in three dimensions. You wanna switch that on. And when I do it, you're going to see an immediate effect. There we go. We now have this spotlight hitting our 3D layer. So where do we go from here to get this fill light happening over on the side of his face? Well, I want the spotlight, which is going to be our fill light, to hit his face, but not any of the background. And that's what I'd be doing on set as well. I'd be making sure that the light was just focusing on him and not spilling out into the rest of the set. And you'd, you'd kind of do that by uh, masking things and flagging things off uh, with physical objects, but we're going to do that in the digital sense. So to do that, we're going to duplicate our clip, just hitting Command D. I'm going to switch the 3D layer off on the bottom layer. And then on the middle layer here, which is the top of our video layers, I'm going to grab my pen tool and just create a quick mask around him. I'll just pause while I'm doing this. And we're going to do it similar to the other lessons that we've seen so far in this course, in that you don't need to do it uh, very specifically. You can get away with a pretty rough mask and then we're going to feather things out. So we'll do that now. We'll hit F on our keyboard again and we'll just feather this out. I'm going to turn the bottom layer off just so we can see what's happening. And we'll just go to our mask expansion. Just make sure that's working there. Okay, we're going to turn our bottom layer back on now so we can see the entire scene. And now we're gonna switch our spotlight back on. So now you can see the spotlight is just affecting the piece that we masked off. Okay, so how do we move the spotlight around into the place that we want? Well, it's pretty simple. You've got this here and it's got three different dimensions that you can move in. You've got your X, your Y, and your Z, as well as your rotations in those dimensions as well. And we could easily just grab this and move it around like so. And as you can see, it starts to illuminate him uh, as I move it past his face. But in this view, it's not so easy to see what we're doing. So down here, you'll notice we've got some new controls since we switched this 3D layer on. Now, at the moment, we're looking at one view, which is just our active camera. That's the default. What I want you to do is I want you to switch it to two views. And over here on the left-hand side, if it doesn't say top, that's fine. Just double click here and you'll get the little arrows that go around the corners, denoting that we're uh, selecting this side. And if you go down here, you can change the camera angle to top. Now, what we're looking at here is a top-down view of our active camera. So if you think about it like this, if I click on my teenager at computer, the middle layer here, it'll highlight this here because that is where it's sitting in 3D space. If I move it uh, forward and back, you'll see it looks like it's zooming in and out on our active camera, but in fact, we're actually moving it further away and towards the camera. So I'm just going to Command Z to send that back to the middle. And again, I'll show you on the bottom layer here, if I select the bottom layer, you can't actually move it in 3D space because it's not ticked on. If I tick it on there, now we've got the option to move it in 3D space. So again, just Command Z to bring it back to the middle there and I'll also switch back off the 3D layer because we don't need it. Now, the reason why it's good to have this top-down view is now if I click the light source here, on my right-hand side on the active camera, I can move up or down in the uh, traditional sense or left or right. But then in our left view over here, the top-down view, I can also move forward and back, which is really handy. So I'm gonna move it back out of our shot here. I'm going to move it up because again, we're trying to match the same angle that this light would be over here, hitting the top of his head. And then I'm just gonna start moving things around a little bit, kind of where I would place them physically on set. 
So now that's kind of where I think the light placement should be. But obviously we want our point of interest to be hitting his face. And that's what this is here. So we can grab that and point it towards his face. So now you can see here as well, uh, we can also do the same thing over here. So you can see if I pan the light all the way off, no light on his face, pan it back on, it acts exactly the same way you would uh, expect a light to act in real life. All right, so I'll leave it there for now. That's looking pretty good to me. Uh, and then I'm just going to close my top down view by going back to a single view, just so it's a little bit easier to see and we'll go fit to full screen. Now, if I turn the light off and on, you'll see there it's actually made it darker, which is not our intended consequence. So that's fine. I'll double click the light here and I'll just bring up the intensity a bit. And we don't wanna to go too far because otherwise it will look silly and blown out. So I'm kind of looking at the hot spot on his face here. Don't wanna to go too much past that. Go to 100, uh, which is where we started from with this new light. And then I'm gonna bring it up to about 150, I think. And again, all the time, just turning this on, off, off and on to see where we started and where we're at. This is adding definitely a bit more in. And look at the top of his head there, that's kind of what I'm looking at and then the side of his face. So I don't wanna to go too much further than that. Otherwise it's going to start looking unrealistic. So we'll do that for now. And it's actually uh, had the added benefit of kind of rolling off the shadow onto his hand here, which I think is quite nice. With the light off, there was quite a bit of light on his hand. So I kind of like what this has done uh, by osmosis there. Double clicking on the light again, we're going to look at the other properties. You can change the cone angle, so you can make it a smaller spotlight or a big wide soft spotlight. So we'll just make it kind of whitish like that. Uh, and then you can feather the cone off as well. So uh, if we go to a really small spotlight like this, you can see that the cone feathering, if I turn it all the way down, you've got a very sharp line, uh, much the same way that the mask feathering works. If you feather it out, it's just a softer fall off. So I'm pretty happy with that there. You've got some other fall off parameters here as well. If I just go to none, uh, have a look at his hand here. It doesn't really do much. If I go back to smooth, uh, it's completely a different thing altogether. And then if I go into inverse square clamped, I think that that has the most realistic fall off. So I've gone inverse square clamp, that's kind of what I default to. And then you can just play with the roll off here. So you can see if I go all the way down, it's rolling back up his face. If I roll it all the way off, we're now getting light on his hand. So I'm gonna find a nice kind of middle ground. I think that works for me. Hopefully you can see this through YouTube. It's very subtle. Hitting okay there. Now turning the light off and on, you're seeing there we've given a little bit more light on the side of his face and the top of his head, but we've also changed the shadows around there. So I think that's looking quite nice. So again, that's subtle. What do we wanna do in the background? Well, I said we wanted to bring the light down here uh, and the light down here. So what I wanna do is I'm happy with the fill light that we've put on our guy here. So I'm going to pre-compose these two and we'll call this uh, boy fill light. If I turn that off and on, you can see what's happening there. All right, so I'll duplicate this layer again and I'll make the middle layer 3D. We'll just leave the bottom one at the moment. We're basically just leaving that stock standard so that we can continue to add things on as we need. I'll just turn it off for now. So this one now is a 3D layer. I wanna add a new light. So right click, go new light. And this time I'm going to go to a point light. And I'm going to use the eyedropper tool here and I'm going to click on the lamp here so I can select the same color. Hitting okay. Uh, we'll see it's kind of changed the color of the overall scene, which is, uh, it's an okay byproduct if you're going for that, but that's not really what we're trying to do. So I'm just going to make sure I've got our point light selected and I'm gonna drag it over the top, just using the red arrow here for the X and then the green arrow here for the Y. And I'm gonna make sure it's sitting right over the top of our lamp here. Now I'm gonna double click and I'm going to just pull the intensity down to probably about there. And I know you're thinking, well, there's no light here anymore and that looks horrible, but it's okay. Like I said before, we can use these lights in conjunction with each other. So I'm gonna right click, go new light. And this time I'm going to put an ambient light in, which basically it works the way it kind of says on the box. It will create ambient light within our scene. So I'll hit okay. And we'll have to go through and just tweak the intensity and see how it looks. So we'll kind of bring things back up to where they were before, roughly around there, I would say. And back to our point light here, I'm going to start bringing this into the negative. And I actually don't like what it's doing on the rest of the scene here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab my ellipse tool up here. But before I do that, I wanna make sure that the bottom layer is turned on again. Don't worry about making it 3D. We don't need it to be 3D for now. Uh, I'm just gonna create an ellipse around the light here. And I'm gonna hit F on the keyboard just to feather things out. And then I'll click off and just see what's happening there. So if we go through here, 
and have a look. We need to motion track that, but we'll worry about that in a moment. If I turn the point light off and on, we've gone from a bright point light that's giving a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of heat onto the walls here to actually something that still is basically illuminating the shot in a similar way, but we're just bringing that intensity out of the light. And by doing it with the same color and then going into the negative and then kind of balancing it out with an ambient light, I think it works really well. So let me turn all of these layers off and we'll just see where we started from. So this is where we started from and this is where we're at now. So it look, it's subtle, but we've added more light to the side of his face and we've brought this down. So before I pre-compose this and deal with the rest of the scene, I wanna just make sure that this light is tracked to the lamp in the background or otherwise it's going to not work. We can motion track things properly like we've already seen within this course, but we're just gonna go the really simple route right now. We're going to go to our point light and we're going to drop this down to our transform properties. And where we've got the position, we just wanna uh, create a keyframe at the very start and we'll make sure that we've dragged this over exactly where we want it to be. And then we'll go to the end and we'll just drag it back over there, so now it should move through at basically the same speed as the camera does. And because we've feathered this out so much, it, uh, it doesn't really matter that it's not exactly the same or if it's not uh, you know, easing in the same way. It's very subtle anyway, so I think this works well. Basically all we're doing with that light in the background is just pulling the intensity out of it. All right, so we're going to pre-compose these now right clicking and going pre-compose and we'll call this uh, practical lamp. So if we turn both of these off, that's our start. We turn the fill light on for the boy and turn the practical lamp down. So the next thing I wanna do is I wanna tackle this light here. I think it's coming in a bit too hot, but I also wanna start bringing a little bit of the idea of volumetric light into this and we'll get into volumetric light a little later on properly in the course, but this is a really good shot that we can do this. So what do I mean by that? I kind of mean like the rays of light that you get coming through a window in a dusky environment like this. So the way I'll do this is I'll right click and I'll go new solid and I wanna use the eyedropper tool here to pick this color. So I'll try and pick the color blue and I think I'll go this like slightly darker one right here, hit okay. Uh, and then what I wanna do is zoom out slightly. I've got my pen tool selected so I can create a mask. Really what I'm trying to do is create a shape like the light is coming through in beams. So I'll turn this back on and I'll just kind of draw it roughly. And remember we can always change this later on if we need to, roughly like that. Now I'll hit F on the keyboard, bring up our feathering properties, feather that all the way out to about there. And then I'll hit T and I'll bring our opacity down quite a lot. So that looks pretty good to me. If I turn it off and on, you'll see immediately that we've added just some like, some duskiness to here. But we want this to be going in the background and not onto him. So how can we, uh, how can we change that? Well, we just need to change the mask a little bit. So that's quite simple. We'll go here and we'll just change the mask so that it doesn't hit him. And because we've got this quite feathered, it doesn't really matter too much if it's on his face a little bit. And up around the computer here. There we go, we'll just uh, go back to full here so you can see it and then we'll turn it off and on. That's on and then off. Now look, it's subtle again, but at the moment if I turn them all off and then all back on, we've definitely changed the feeling of this scene, but without changing the realities of the scene, which I think is, uh, which is really important. Now it is still a little bit bright over here for me, so uh, what can we do to just pull this down a little bit? Well, as you guessed, it's probably really simple. I'm just gonna duplicate the bottom layers again and I'll create a simple mask around our light source here which we wanna be a little bit less intense. And I'm going to turn this off now so we're just seeing this. I'll go up to the effects and presets here and grab brightness and contrast and drop that onto our layer. Now I do wanna make sure this mask is a little bit more feathered so I'm just gonna hit F on the keyboard and feather the mask out quite a bit. And then I am going to go to our brightness and contrast and just pull that down. But I'll turn the bottom layer on again so we can see it in context. So now we can just bring that down And also we can expand this a bit more because you know, uh, you can see the feathering around here, we're losing it on the edges. So we'll bring the feathering back out and we'll just expand this whole thing now. So just pull the mask out a bit further and then continue to feather it out. Now, if I turn this off and on, we've basically just taken the intensity of the light out of there. So now we can just look at all of these together. We'll turn them off and turn them back on. 
and we've gone from something that was, you know, it was fine. That shot was completely fine. Uh, it looked quite nice. We analyzed it earlier. We saw all the light in the environment that we were playing with, but then we've just accentuated things and pushed it in the direction that we wanted to go, which is just slightly moodier, slightly more cinematic, slightly more uh, intrigue. So we've got this kind of dusky light coming through. Uh, we've pulled the intensity down here. We've pulled the intensity down here using two different techniques and we've added a fill light on his face here. So let's go through and we'll turn them on one by one. So the first thing we did, add the fill light. The next thing, pull the intensity down at the back, add our duskiness, and then pull the intensity down on the side there. It's pretty simple, really. Uh, they're, they're basic tools here, and it's just knowing how to use them and knowing how to analyze what you're working with so that you don't get you know, too far out of the realms of possibility. Now, the last thing we need to do is just track things through. So we wanna make sure that this blue uh, cyan kind of light source thing gets tracked through properly. On our clip here, it's probably fine to not do it, but we'll do it properly. We'll pull our playhead here so we know it lines up. So this kind of works around the edge of the laptop here. What I wanna do is go to this bottom layer, right click, go track and stabilize track motion. And we'll just make a nice little track in here. That's gonna to be too big. Move over, probably something around that. Uh, we'll track forward and we'll track backward. And once we've got our tracker there, we'll make sure that the target is on the blue cyan. Uh, we'll hit OK and hit apply and hit OK again. And now that's tracked through. But again, we're dealing with our old nemesis, the anchor point. So let's just move that back into place. Go. Uh, let's just scale that up a little bit just so we don't run into any trouble. And I'm pretty happy. Let's play it through. So this is how you can analyze the scene that you're working with. Then you can add things and accentuate lights that are already there. But let's move on to another shot that's very different where you don't have any obvious light sources. And we'll look at how we can kind of create some more drama, create that kind of cinematic feel that we're trying to achieve in this course. Uh, again, with very basic tools in After Effects. Now, this is a well shot piece of footage. It's nicely exposed, it's well color balanced. But again, we're dealing with our old nemesis here basically just white walls, white bedspread, white lamp, white bowl, white top, everything is white and bland and there's not much character to it in terms of the shape of the light. It's just kind of soft light on the wall and then on our subject, which soft lighting looks nice, but when it's soft lit on a white surface, uh, there's, there's not much to it. So we're gonna quickly look at how we can really rapidly change the shape of this light within After Effects, just using solids and masks and not even diving into anything like the 3D lights or any other presets or effects or anything like that that After Effects has to offer. We're going simple right now. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna just create some shape to the light already in the room. Now we can see that there is a little bit of shadow behind her here. Uh, and there's a little bit of shadow on this side as well. And we've already kind of got a little bit of, uh, you know, directional light happening in the center of this shot. So let's just accentuate that. First of all, I'm just going to right click down here, new solid, and I'm going to create a black solid. It's going to be the exact same size as my frame here. Now I'm just going to grab my pen tool and I'm just remembering where things were before. So this section here, I wanna make a strip of light. I'm just going to create a little mask around my solid here and then we'll refine that now uh, so that we can kind of get that a little bit better. So we'll pull that down to a roundabout here and just trying to get a bit of a strip of light coming through. We don't really wanna hit her hair too much because she's well lit uh, and we'll come down to a roundabout here. All right, that works for me. So clicking on our black solid layer there, hitting F on my keyboard to bring up the feathering properties. And I'm just gonna feather that out about that much. That looks pretty good to me. I'm now hitting T on my keyboard and I'm bringing the opacity down and I'm gonna bring it down to, what's that, around about 30. That looks pretty good to me. Now I'm going to do the exact same thing again and we're going to create that strip of light on this side and accentuate that just a little bit further. Right clicking new solid and we're gonna do a black solid again. And again, we are going to create a mask on this. So I've actually done a pretty good job of that. I'll just tidy it up slightly uh, and we'll kind of get that angle 
similar to how it was over on this side. That works for me. Again, hitting F on our keyboard, bringing up our feathering, and then hitting T on our keyboard, bringing it down to around 30% or so, whatever looks good. That works better there. There was naturally a bit more shadow happening on this side of the wall. So we'll make this one slightly lighter. I'm gonna bring it to 20 and we'll make this one 30. Now clicking off that, we'll see what it's looking like. Let's turn these off at the same time. So that's back to our original and then on. You can see there we've just added a bit more of a strip of directional light. Now the last thing I wanna to do to just sell this a little bit further is create a vignette just to tie it all together. So right clicking, new, solid, black solid. And I'm going up, instead of my pen tool, I'm grabbing the ellipse tool here. Uh, you can do a uh, rounded tool, rectangle tool. I'm grabbing the ellipse tool and I'm just going to drag an ellipse across screen as so. I'm going to go inverted and I'm again hitting our feathering tool, bringing that feathered all the way out like so and going to our opacity and bringing that down. Now I'm just gonna balance this out and see how it feels. I'll go all the way off, introduce just a little bit of it and I think around about there works well for me. All right, so this is with it on, and this is with it off, and this is with it on. So it's just created way more kind of, you know, direction for that light spill, and it just it just creates a bit more intrigue within the shot, and it feels a little bit more, I guess, yeah, motivated. Now, let's, uh, let's look at how we can quickly motion track this. Obviously, we've got a little bit of motion in the scene here. You could probably get away with not motion tracking this, but let's do it properly. We can pre-compose all of our lighting effects here. So we can pre-compose this. I'm gonna call this a uh, relight. And then again, we're just going to go motion tracking. So right click on the layer uh, with our footage, track and stabilize, track motion. Just gonna drag out a uh, tracking point here. And I think these blueberries will probably do us a good job here. Going to track all the way forward. And then I'm simply going to edit the target, make sure that relight is selected, hit OK, hit apply, hit OK. And we're gonna to have to play around with it again because we'll have our old friend, the uh, anchor point to, to deal with. So just get that back into roughly the right position. And because there is gonna be a little bit of movement outside the bounds, I'm going to go ahead and scale this up by about 20%. So let's hit that there and see what it looks like. So that's playing through with it on now and I'll show you what it looks like with it off. I'll just flick between the two and let's go full screen so you can see it. That's with a little bit more shape and direction and that's with it off. Just bland white walls. It looks fine if you're shooting kind of, you know, a breakfast commercial, which this probably is. Uh, but if you turn it on, you've just got a little bit more, a little bit more going on there, a little bit more shape to the light. And it's as easy as that. That's three solids and some masks in After Effects and we're just using feathering and opacity as well as that little bit of motion tracking. Really simple stuff. So having just looked at how we can add our own lights in After Effects to augment and enhance lighting that we find in our scene, let's look at some tips and tricks we can employ on set in order to get the best out of our lighting tools that we have on hand when creating content on a budget. First up, let's talk about clean plates. No, I'm not talking about finishing your vegetables before you get your dessert. I'm talking about taking the extra time and effort on set to capture a clean plate of your shot in order to use this to your advantage in post. Let's say you have a limited number of lights on hand, but your shot calls for you to shoot towards a window with your subject in front of that window. Now to combat the sunlight coming through the window, you would generally fill the space and illuminate the subject with as much light as you can, and then expose your camera to match, bringing up the ambient light in the space and on the subject whilst also filtering the sunlight coming into the space by using diffusion on the outer side of the window and neutral density filters on your lens. But what if you only have a small LED light and a relatively wide shot? Well, this is where clean plates can be your best friend. First things first, you need to set up the composition of your shot. Get your actor in place, get all of the background dressed, know exactly what you want and make sure you're happy with it because we've got to shoot a few versions of this. If you need to bring in extra lights actually into the frame of the shot to illuminate the actor's face properly, make sure you do that now. It's totally okay, we'll remove those later on. Once you're finished and you're happy with the actor's performance, you can remove them from the frame. But don't move anything else and keep the camera focused where the actor was. The next thing you'll need to do is if you moved any light sources into the frame or into the shot, you just need to walk them slightly back, walk them just outside of your frame, but trying to keep as much illumination present as possible. Get a clean plate of this shot. 
Now once you've got this clean plate with the light stands moved but keeping the interior exposure at the same level as when your actor was in shot, it's time to now expose the camera down to match the light coming in through the window. You'll notice that you lose all detail in the interior shadows here. Again, make sure that your camera is still focused in the same place as it was when your actor was in frame. If that's all done correctly on set, then the next steps are to bring it all together in After Effects. So let's jump back into our project now and see how to take all of those plates that we just shot and bring them together into one coherent piece. What I've got here is I've got three pieces of our footage. Now I'm just doing a small section to demonstrate for this lesson, but on top we've got our actor take. So let's name that one, we've got actor. And then on the second layer here, you can see we've got our clean plate one. And then underneath that, you can see we've got our clean plate two, which is our uh, exposed one for the window. Now let's just set this so that we can see everything that's happening in the frame. Uh, we'll turn them all back on. And basically what we need to do is we need to paint out the light stands uh, on both sides. Then we need to kind of do a little bit of rotoscoping or masking, depending on, on what footage you're actually working with. For this one, I think the rotoscoping is gonna work. So we'll do a little bit of rotoscoping around me here. Uh, and then the final phase here is to do some masking around the windows to bring out uh, this exposure here. And then finally, to tie it all together, once we've done that, you'll see we just do a little bit of tweaking to the exposure of this window to sell the effect a little bit more. You can see in reality, this is very blown out in the background. We don't wanna have perfect exposure behind me in this final shot, in the final composition, because it, to, the, to the eye, it will look weird. It will look a bit uh, off. So we'll expose it up slightly, but you'll still retain a lot of the detail of what's happening in the background here. Uh, versus what you're seeing here, which is just a blown out mess. All right, so the first thing we'll do, we'll start by getting rid of these light frames. So on our actor plate here, I'm just going to pause this just in a, in a random spot, making sure I've got the actor piece of footage selected. I'm just going to go and grab my pen tool to bring up a mask. And I'm just going to start creating a mask around uh, this. Now, because when I turn this off, you'll see, let's have a look at this section for the, for the time being. When I turn this off, you'll see the exposure will change a little bit just because we've had to move some lights around. So I actually wanna grab a fair amount up above here as well. So we'll just start clicking around. We might have to do the masks a couple of times, but it's a little bit of trial and error. We'll just see what works. So I'll click kind of around about here, uh, and then I'm just going to zoom out a little bit uh, and go all the way up above and kind of around about here as well. Bring it down to around about here, and we'll just kind of start to create a bit of a mask around here. Now, it'll be a little bit different around my leg here. We might have to do, um, you know, a little bit of tweaking around this later on, but we'll see how we go and we can probably just close the mask there. Now, obviously it's removed me from the shot. Now uh, you'll see here, if I go back, uh, it's removed me from the shot. So we just hit M on our keyboard a couple of times to bring up our mask properties here, and we'll change this from add to subtract. So now I'm in the shot, but the light stand isn't because what's showing up underneath is clean plate one. But as you can see, we've got a little bit of muck happening around here because there is a slightly different exposure. So let's play with the mask properties a little bit. We'll play with our feather and our mask expansion. So I'm gonna start by feathering it out and we'll just sort of see what that looks like. And we'll just zoom in a little bit here so we can see what's actually happening. You can see the frame's starting to come back in. So we won't feather that far, obviously. Let's pull it back down. And then we'll just play with our mask expansion as well. We can go a little bit out. Now, I don't wanna lose much on my leg here, so I'm just gonna pull this in. And if we need to do slightly different tweaks here, so we're basically looking at the adjustment of uh, the exposure on this side, so that's fine. But obviously we're getting some uh, issues with my knee here. What we can just do is we'll just pull this up so we're not affecting my knee at all. And we'll just create another mask. So clicking off uh, to get rid of that mask, hitting on our actor layer again, grabbing our pen tool. Let's just create another little mask around this section and we'll also set this to subtract. Uh, and again, just around the chair here, let's play with that there. And I think that looks pretty good. Uh, I'll just give that last mask that we made just a little bit of uh, feathering just to make sure we're not losing any of the chair there. That's what I'm looking at. And we'll go back to our fit and we'll just see uh, what that looks like. And I think it looks good. Now it looks like there's a bit of discoloration on the floor there. It doesn't actually look like there's an exposure change because the final image, because whoever's viewing the final image, sorry, will not actually know that there's a light stand there. 
they're just going to see that as a bit of a different color on the floor. They're not going to see that as any kind of uh, exposure change because of something we've removed. So I think this is perfectly acceptable. Next thing we need to do is get rid of this monstrosity here. So it's the exact same process, clicking on our actor layer here, uh, going and making sure we've got our pen tool selected, just creating a little mask around our light. And again, we might have to do some tweaking, so don't worry about that. We can just go around and uh, fix that up once we've done this. So let's see what this looks like. Uh, again, we need to go back and make sure that says subtract. There we go, we've dropped that out. So that's actually done a remarkably good job. I don't think we need to do any tweaking there whatsoever. But we'll have a look. There are some moments here that look a little bit iffy. So we'll just grab our mask uh, feather and we'll just feather this out a little bit, only a little bit. And we'll just pull out our mask expansion as well, just to make sure that we're not getting any weird lines. So we'll just go back to fit and we'll see if that's worked and it has by the looks of it. So that's nice. All right, so that is with our uh, stands removed. So that's great. We can play through here and that looks pretty good. Now, if you wanted to leave it at this level, that's so fine. You, we don't need to correct the background if you don't want to. We can just live with a blown out image, but still have me uh, nicely exposed. Let's zoom in here so we can actually see. So at the moment, this is perfectly acceptable. If you wanted to stop here and move on, it would be totally fine. Uh, it looks good. No one would ever know that we've removed those light stands. So let's just uh, duplicate this layer again and I'll delete the mask so we can see what we've done. So we've gone from this to this. That's completely acceptable. Let's play it through and I'll switch them on and off as we're going. Like, you know, that, that's that's really good. So we, we were able to bring our lights in to expose me properly against that window, but then very easily able to paint them out. Now this obviously works because uh, I'm static in the shot while I'm not moving past the light frames. Uh, and also because those light frames don't move and the camera doesn't move. So this is a pretty easy shot to do this with, but you know what, if, if there was some movement, uh, if I was moving through frame or if the camera was moving or something like that, it wouldn't be too hard to motion track those masks. We've already seen how to do some motion track in this course already. So there we go, that's with the light frames taken out. Now, as I said, we could uh, we could just stop and be happy with this, but let's say we wanna bring in uh, some more exposure like this window into our uh, final composited shot. Let's look at how we can do that now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take our actor and our clean plate one, which we've just uh, composited here, and I'm going to right click and go down to pre-compose. I'm going to call this stands removed. So this is stands removed and then underneath we've got our uh, exposed window here. Now what I wanna do is I wanna duplicate stands removed and I'm gonna bring a clean one underneath the bottom. So we've got stands removed, then clean plate two and then stands removed on top. Now the one on top, I'm going to grab our uh, rotor brush tool up here on the top left uh, and I'm going to just double click into this and then I'm going to drag the rotor tool over me. Uh, and I really only need my torso here, anything that's in front of the window. Now holding option uh, on a Mac, uh, Alt on a PC, I believe, uh, you get the little red button up here and let's just pull that off to make sure it's just grabbing where I need. I'm also going to change the quality to best up in here in our rotor brush tool. I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit and make sure that's been removed there. Uh, and I'll just grab a little bit more of me here. Uh, and then that's, that's pretty good. Let's just see how it's looking up top. I think that'll that'll do the trick for now. We can go through and we can change these uh, rotor brush properties later on. Now I can go through frame by frame with my page up and page down keys to make sure this is all good. But what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna hit freeze and we're, we're gonna hope for the best here. We're just gonna see if this works for us. I think it will. All right, so that has frozen now. Let's go back to our composition. And what you can see here is that I'm just a uh, a floating torso in the darkness, which is obviously not what we want, but that's okay. We're, we're halfway through the process. So uh, we'll just play this through and we'll see how the rotoscope has done. Uh, it's done okay. Um, let's, let's just have a look closely at my arm here. Uh, there's a little bit of flicker around. So let's just, before we move on, let's just clean up the roto a little bit. I'll just zoom in slightly. Going up into our uh, roto tools here, so make sure that the top layer is selected. Let's just reduce the chatter by maybe 10 uh, and we'll shift the edge in a little bit. We don't wanna to lose too much uh, and then I'll feather it as well, just a little bit. Just kind of doing this by eye for a second and we'll just uh, go back and see if this has worked. I think that has done the trick for now. So we'll see if we need to refine that any further later on, but for now, I think we're looking pretty good. Move on to the next step and actually make this look uh, usable, not 
weird like it looks now. Clicking on our clean plate two down here in our layers, we're going to go and grab our mask tool again. And the first thing we're going to do is we'll just pick an area of the window to mask out. Now, potentially depending on your piece of footage that you're working with, uh, you could potentially just do one mask like this and you could be done with it. And then you've got your window in the background. But obviously for us, we've got these kind of crossbars and we've got the lamp and things like that. So we're gonna have to do some individual masks. I'll just delete this one and we will start properly. So zooming in here, I'm just going to create our first mask. Again, making sure clean plate two is selected. I'm just gonna create our first mask here uh, around this part of the window. So clicking in the corner here, clicking in the corner at the bottom and then anywhere behind me, it's fine, doesn't matter. Uh, and then just kind of lining it up like so. Uh, I'll pull this one down just so that that line there was straight. Now, zooming out, you see there we've got uh, our blown out window, but then we've also got our uh, exposed window and it's behind me because this top layer is rotoscoped. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go through and we're going to uh, kind of mask all of these out individually and I'll feather them and just do a little bit of cleaning up of the masks. And you'll see that in a time lapse because you don't need to sit and watch me do all these masks right now. And then we'll come back and we'll work out how we can bring it all together and kind of sell the effect. So bear with me for a second, I'll hit fast forward. All right, so I've finished the masks around the window here and it looks pretty good. Uh, and let's play through and just see kind of where we're at. So see, I've got a little bit of, uh, you know, the rotoscope happening around me here and it looks it looks okay. Um, we might need to just refine these edges a little bit further, which we can do shortly. Uh, we can also add just like a little bit of a blur and stuff in the background so you're not noticing that too much. Uh, but when I zoom out uh, so we can see this in full, you can just see it doesn't look 100% correct because remember we've gone from like that really uh, kind of overexposed section in the background to uh, something that is kind of perfectly exposed and that just wouldn't happen in reality. So what I actually wanna do is bring the exposure back up a little bit more in this section, even if it does seem a little bit counterintuitive. So I'll do that now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to our effects and presets and I'm going to once again grab the Lumetri color uh, and bring that onto our clean plate too. Now, uh, under basic correction, I'm just going to kick the exposure up by one and see what that looks like. And it's not blown out things, but it's starting to look a little bit more in the realms of probability. Uh, and then I'm gonna bring up the highlights by about 50 and we'll just see where that sits. Uh, I'm gonna bring now the exposure back down, 0 0.5. And I think that looks a little bit more natural. I'm also gonna drop the saturation a little bit. I'm just gonna drop it by about 10, so to 90. Uh, and I'm gonna bring the warmth up a little bit. So I'm gonna add uh, maybe 15 or so in the positive direction, which uh, adds a little bit more warmth uh, there. So now it looks like a nice sunny day out there. I also wanna grab uh, a Gaussian blur and just add a little bit of blur because at the moment we're getting a real deep focus effect uh, because we stopped down to 11, but then our actual, um, our actual first shot is F4. So we're naturally going to get some uh, blurring in the background there as we've learned uh, recently. So I'm just going to drop the Gaussian blur on clean plate two. And I'm gonna drop that to maybe, let's try seven and see what happens. I think that looks pretty good there. I'm um, just having a look at it with, you know, kind of fresh eyes. Now the keen eyed people amongst you will notice that there's an extra little uh, cushion poking out here. Now what that is is once I stood up from this seat and removed those lights and walked away, the cushion raised up because I was no longer pushing it down. So these are the things you've got to think about. And I wanted to leave this in just to show you the, you know, that it's not always perfect. You do have to really think about what's happening on set when you use clean plates in order to make sure that nothing's changing in between shots uh, because it can be difficult to paint things out. Now I could spend a lot of time and go through and paint that out uh, digitally, but I think to sell this, uh, sell this effect, we've kind of, we kind of got ourselves there. So let's play it through. So that's with all of our composition done, that's including bringing the window in the background there up. And then let's play it through with our original shot here as well. So originally we had those light stands in place uh, and the window blown out behind me. Then we removed the light stands of course, and then this is what we were finally left with. So I think it looks pretty good. Um, now, like I said, halfway through, you can stop when you get to the point of just getting rid of the light stands. And, and maybe if I was using this shot in reality, I might actually have done that, especially since I've got this this little, uh, this little pillow peeking out here. But if this was just a quick shot that you needed to correct, I think, you know, one or two seconds on screen, no one's really going to notice these kind of things. Uh, the little bit of discoloration in the floor and things like that from where we mask stuff out. So 
learn how to do these techniques, learn what you can get away with and sort of learn um, how far you can push the effect before it becomes unsellable. And then learn how you can pull these effects back as well to get a more realistic feeling, depending on you know what you're going for, obviously. All right, so that's how to use some basic compositing tools and techniques uh, in After Effects. And they're really basic. Like I said, just some masks and layers. And also thinking about, you know, what we're going to do in post-production when you're actually on set and making sure that you get what you need on the day so that your, uh, your post-production journey is as smooth as possible. All right, speaking of journey, let's move on to our next lesson. Now that we've added depth, texture, highlights and shadows, and even worked out how to use compositing tools, to get the most out of our camera and lighting, we can look at some of the more niche, but also very powerful tools in After Effects to add volumetric lighting to our scenes and increase the presence of other motivated light sources that might be present. So what do we mean by volumetric lighting? Put simply, volumetric lighting is the rays of light that we might see coming through a window, often referred to in cinematography as god rays or light beams. Some classic examples are light shining through windows into a dusty or smoky environment, allowing us to physically see the existence of the ray of light whilst also illuminating the general scene. Volumetric lighting is the digital recreation of this lighting effect and it's the product of some pretty intense computational witchcraft, but luckily we don't need to understand that in order to make use of it. Now the great thing about creating content in this era is that we have so many options at hand and tools at our disposal. We'll continue to be looking at After Effects for these examples, but know that these effects can be achieved to varying results in other programs as well, such as DaVinci Resolve, which offers wonderful motion and surface tracking, as well as industry leading color correction and grading tools. If you do want to learn a little bit more about DaVinci Resolve, you can check out my course, Introducing Beginner Editors to DaVinci Resolve, which takes an entire overview of the program. And I also have an introduction to color grading in Resolve, where we dive deeper into the color tab to look at how we can color correct our footage and then use grading techniques to shift the mood, tone and emotion of our scenes. If you're not already subscribed to the Envato Tuts Plus YouTube channel, make sure you get subscribed today as we're putting out super helpful content daily, completely for free. So hit that little red subscribe button below right now, I'll wait. All right, let's jump into After Effects once again and learn how we can create some amazing volumetric lighting effects. Now that we know a little bit more about volumetric lighting in theory, let's look at how we can practically recreate it or accentuate it here in After Effects. Now I've got this little shot here, it's just a uh, tracking movement through what appears to be an old church. You've got light streaming in from the window above on the right hand side and then a little bit, uh, you know, ducked between the middle of these banisters here. Uh, we're not really looking at any of these lights, those ones are practical lamps as we've learnt earlier. What we are looking at is, you can see, there is a slight ray coming in through this window here. It's just happening around about here. Let me pause it. There's this ray of light that's collecting up in the dusty section and I'll play it through with a little bit more zoom here so that we can see it. There's just this ray of light happening in this dusky kind of dusty section. Now we want to take that ray of light that's actually there and just accentuate it further. And there are some great tools in After Effects. As I keep mentioning, there, there are so many great tools in After Effects, but there's a really good tool to do this very quickly. And basically it's exactly what you think it should be. It's light rays. So let's just search in our effects and presets for light rays. So CC light rays here under generate. Let's just drag this on top of our footage. Now you can see here it's added what appears to be a light and I'll just drag it around here. But as I move it, you can see it's picking up solid parts of the image and kind of generating light rays based on what it's seeing there. So it doesn't really make much sense in the context of this part of the image, but as soon as I put it over this window here, it's starting to make sense about where those uh, light rays would be separated. And they'd be separated by these bars that are on the window. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go back to the start of our clip here and I'll bring our light rays up to this section here, so we're uh, second from the right hand side in this middle window and I'll pop it right in the middle. Now, if I change some of the parameters over here in our effects controls, I can change the intensity and that's pretty self-explanatory. If I go super intense, we obviously get a really blown out light source, but really intense light rays. Uh, and then if I don't go intense enough, we don't really get anything. So I'll reset that back to what it was, 100. Uh, and then also obviously you've got your center here, which as I move that around, uh, you know, you can you can kind of do that by just clicking and dragging it or you can do it here if you want to fine tune things. Now you've got the radius as well. If I just zoom that in, you'll start to see what the effect is actually doing. Uh, it's just 
taking everything that's in the scene and generating it out as a light beam. But uh, if you go too far in the wrong direction with the radius there, uh, things don't work very well. And if you go too far the other direction, you don't get any light rays at all. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. Uh, what it starts with is something around here, which is, uh, which is pretty good. Actually, I think it starts with 40. So let's just keep it on the default. So warp softness makes sense as well. It's just kind of how soft these light beams or how hard these light beams are coming in. Uh, I think I'm just gonna play with it and see what it looks like around about there. And then obviously the shape of those beams as well. So you can go round or square. Uh, and it just depends on the kind of taste that you're going for. I think square tends to work pretty well, especially as we've got this square grid here on the window. I think square will work. Now, if you go color from source, it's just going to pick up the color of the light coming through and just uh, continue that with the beams. If I turn that off and I can go up here, I can change the light coming through. If we want to add a little bit of a warm light coming into our scene, uh, we can do that. But I'm going to just keep it on color from source. Now, the last thing is we've got the transfer mode. You've got add none. Well, none makes sense. <laughs> uh, you've got add lighten or screen. So at the moment it's on add. Let's have a look at it with lighten. So you can see it's not generating any extra light there, but I actually think the transfer mode that works best is screen. There we go. It's again, it's not generating any extra light, but as I move through here, you can see those beams are still very clear. Okay, so the last thing I need to do with the CC light rays, again, like I said, really simple tool, really powerful, but really simple. I'm just clicking on my piece of footage here, making sure that my playhead is at the start of the clip and I'm setting a keyframe here on the center. So I'll click the stopwatch to set a keyframe and I'm just gonna hit you on my keyboard to bring that up. So then we wanna drag our playhead to the end and we wanna move our light ray center to the same window, but obviously it's disappeared now. It's off screen once we get to the end of this clip. So I'm going to drag back until that light source, until that window that we have, which is the uh, second window from the right in this window here. Let's just see when it's just about to go off screen, which is just there. Let's drag this up and we'll make sure that keyframe's there. Uh, and then we're going to just kind of have to use our eye here and work out where this is going to land. So if it started here, if it's ending here, then we can kind of just guess that it'll end up around about here. So we'll just do this. And it doesn't really matter because as soon as you go out of the frame here, you see those lights stop generating. So let's just see what that looks like if we do that. So I think it looks good and it looks pretty realistic, but what I don't like is the way the beams just really harshly drop off uh, as soon as it goes out of the frame. So I'm gonna cheat things a little bit and, uh, and go to our end keyframe here and just make that light source sit right on the edge here, just so that we uh, still maintain a little bit of the beam all the way through our clip. So there we go, it's looking pretty good, but I think it's looking still a little bit wacky. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to delete this middle keyframe and let's play that through. And I think that's going to sort us out. Yeah, that looks pretty good there. Now I wanna pull the intensity of this down because it's still kind of moving all over the place. So let's pull the intensity down and see what that's doing. And also let's maybe put this to round and just see if that gives us a slightly different uh, result. And I think I'm just going to uh, pull up the radius a little bit as well. All right, so that looks pretty good. Maybe it's a little bit over the top, but uh, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to accentuate things here. So we'll leave it at that for now. What we can also do is add a bit of a lens flare because you know if the light was shining through the window as it is like this, there would be likely some lens flare happening uh, unless you had a really good matte box well positioned to just kind of cut that flare without actually seeing it in shot. Uh, so let's generate a lens flare as well. So up in our effects and presets, we're going to go and search for lens flare and we'll drag that on top of our footage as well. And you can see it's just generated a pretty wacky looking lens flare here. Uh, and it, you know, it doesn't look good. We, <laughs> we can see that it doesn't look good there. Well, it doesn't look realistic. So what we wanna do first of all is put our lens flare center where our light would be coming from. And so that's up in this section here. We can do it right in the middle where our light beams are coming from as well actually. And 
you know, you can change the, the lens that you're working with to change the property of the flare. So at the moment, we've got the lens type as a 50 to 300 millimeter zoom lens. We can look at it with a 35 millimeter prime lens. And you see that that blooms quite big down here. Uh, or we can look at it with the 105 millimeter prime lens, which I think works the best. So there we go. That's the most natural looking one, in my opinion. And we're just going to bring the brightness down by about 50%. We just want a little bit of a hint there. We don't want it to be uh, too overbearing. Now this doesn't move at all, so we do need to track this through. So we'll just create a keyframe here on our flare center. So it's created a keyframe down here. Just drag that to the end and create another keyframe. Zooming out a little bit, I'm going to move the flare center up to around about here, just so we get a bit of movement coming through as we go. So I'll just quickly scrub through that and you can see that the lens flare center is moving and creating a different effect as we go. So let's play it through and see what it actually looks like. We might need to do a little bit of tweaking. That looks pretty natural to me. You can see the lens flare uh, kind of moving across the screen here. Let's just blend it with the original by, you know, maybe 20, 40% or so. Uh, let's see what that looks like. Let it render here. I think that looks pretty good and doesn't look too distracting. So there's a few more things we can do to sell this effect. Let's grab a brightness and contrast uh, effect again, and we'll drop that onto our footage. We wanna bring the brightness of the footage down just a little bit, just to accentuate this kind of duskiness. Uh, and we'll just bring the contrast up a little bit. So I think that looks pretty good. We'll play it through again and see where we're at. Starting to look a lot more moody now, a lot more mysterious, which I like. Uh, and then the final thing I want to do is I want to make sure that this light that's coming through, which, you know, feasibly would be the same kind of window as we've got here. I want to make sure there's some sort of light beam coming through there as well. And I can't just add another light ray there because there's nothing really to accentuate. There's nothing really to pick up. So we're going to use the same technique that we used in one of the previous lessons in this course, where we just create a solid over the top of this and then we'll mask and feather it and then play with the opacity as well to get that similar kind of light beam effect. So. We'll right click here, go new solid, and we're going to create a white solid over the top. And then we're going to grab our pen tool and we're going to just kind of try and remember where this uh, light beam would be and then we can refine it once uh, it reveals itself. So let's go roughly around about here. Uh, and now we can see I was close, but nowhere near. <laughs> uh, so we'll just move our edges of the mask over here. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so we can kind of match the angle of this light. I think something like this might work. Do we want the beam to come down there? Maybe, maybe there. We want the beam to kind of hit the edge of the stair. We'll see what that looks like. So I'll hit F on my keyboard and then I'm just going to feather this out somewhat and hit T and then bring the opacity down uh, to somewhere around about there. Let's see what that looks like all together. That looks, uh, that looks pretty realistic, I think. Uh, it's shining a nice bit of light on there. And then obviously we've got some nice drop off there. Uh, so if I turn it off and on, that looks pretty realistic. Now I'll just uh, make sure that this motion is tracked to it. So I'll hit that there. Go down to our mask path and create a keyframe and then create a keyframe at the end as well and just rejig our mask. So sitting around about there, I think. Let's have a look. Yeah, that's roughly roughly the case. And again, like we did in the previous lessons, we don't need to be too uh, too finicky with the mask here because we've feathered so much of it out. All right, so let's just have a play through this and see what it's looking like. So I think it looks really good. There's a lot of atmosphere now. There's volumetric atmosphere happening. We've got the lens flare and we've got the light rays that are coming through the window, which are interacting with the bars on the window. Uh, and then we've got that basic little shape mask. Uh, that solid mask in the background, creating that artificial beam of light coming from behind this pillar. So let's have a look at what we had originally. So this is the original piece of footage here and we'll play it through. So in its own right, this original piece of footage was pretty well shot. It has a little bit of volumetric lighting coming through, a little bit of moodiness happening. But what we've done here is we've added the light rays and the lens flare and also brought down the overall brightness and increased the contrast as well. And then we've also added this little strip of light in the background as well. Now, turning that on, that little strip of light looks way too intense, but I think with it all together, 
once you watch it through a couple of times, it actually all starts to make sense uh, in the world. And it feels like it fits. It does feel like it fits in this world. So there we go, a pretty quick and easy way to add some volumetric mood to your scenes in After Effects. Basically by just analyzing the shot, looking at what light we have available, uh, and then you know knowing the tools and how to tweak them within After Effects to get a realistic result. Well, that's it. We've come to the end of the course on creating cinematic lighting within After Effects. I hope that you found this course useful in your post-production journey, as well as your work on set. And maybe if you're someone who just works in post-production, it's inspired you to check out the camera and lighting department. Or maybe you're a budding cinematographer looking to use After Effects as a tool to enhance your images. Either way, let me know down in the comments what you took out of this course. And as always, let me know what you want to learn next.